Well, good morning again, ladies in the room, and good morning to you tuning in online. I'm so glad you're here. This is week three of our study in the kingdom, and today our teacher, Janet Segrin, says we're going to explore our assumptions about kingdoms and come to understand how different God's kingdom is, and Janet says it's going to blow our mind. Now, this is 2020, so like the whole year basically has blown our mind. So that's a tall order. I'm looking forward to her delivering on that promise. Let me open us in prayer, and then I will turn it over to Janet. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for the ladies who are here in the room. And I know uh, we've gathered, you know, with kind of different sets of needs during this ongoing time of global pandemic. And thank you for those who are tuning in online, who either because of caution or convenience or whatever the reason, they're tuning in on YouTube to hear more about your kingdom. May we grasp the truths we're going to hear today and may we translate them into our lives so that we um, understand that the kingdom we are called to is not a normal kingdom. Lord, we love you, and we give this uh, teaching segment to you. I pray for our teacher, Janet, that she will stand on the, um, stand in confidence on the preparations she has made, and that she will faithfully bring your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. And I always do this. I forget to introduce myself. My name is Lori Davies. I'm the women's ministry director here at Grace Community Church, and it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Janet this morning. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Good morning, ladies. Ha! Ah, okay. <laughs> it's good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, I really enjoy that. Before we begin, I do want to talk to you about something that's kind of made my heart sing. I appreciate that some of you have been doing some of the homework, or even as we've been going through scripture, your hearts have been open to maybe what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, and, and you're learning and seeing new things yourself. So I'm going to point out a couple of things that came from last week's lesson. Uh, when we talked about the treasure and the pearl, one of the uh, gals who attended class noticed that, um, and you're going to see that a little bit in the, in, in, in the parables today, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like... And sometimes the next word that he says, it's what it's about, but maybe not. Because last week we talked about that the kingdom is worth letting go of everything I have in order to gain it. And we said it's like a treasure and like a pearl. But the one that says like a pearl, it doesn't say it's like a pearl. It says it's like the merchant. And as she had studied that a couple of years ago, she had interpreted that as, the, as that Jesus was looking for the treasure and came to earth to get it. Um, and so it's interesting when you share those with me, how you just see it a little differently. Someone else noticed that in the parable about the sower and the seeds and the soil, that in the one about the rocky soil, both in the original one, the, the telling of the story, as well as the interpretation, the word immediately pops up and ask, I wonder if there's something about acting quickly that is a signal that the soil might be a little rocky. Um, and I went, well, how cool. So I would encourage you to do that, to read the scriptures yourself, to think about what they say and mean to you um, as we go through them. Because you will, have, over your lifetime in churchdom, will have heard a lot of sermons on some of these scriptures. And so you're gonna wanna take what you've heard, but then read it again yourself and see what God might reveal to you in your own reading of it. Okay, so welcome to week three. Today, the lesson title is, It's Not Your Normal Kingdom. Uh, and I think this is a significant part of the kingdom to remember. Before we begin, let's go ahead and do a quick review. I just wanted to review some of the major points from lesson one that we talked about. Remember we talked about that the kingdom was what Jesus talked about the most. By the way, I didn't tell you then, but I'll tell you now. There was a someone he talked about more than any of the things, and that was God and the Father. That's mentioned by Jesus more than all the other stuff combined. 
the kingdom has several names. We're not going to draw a distinction between the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, his kingdom, kingdom of the Father, my kingdom, the kingdom. We're talking about the same kingdom for our purposes. And that the kingdom is both now and in the future. That Jesus inaugurated the kingdom when he came to earth. It began. And I think a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are going to reinforce that. Um, but that there's a future culminating kingdom that looks different even than what it does now. And you're going to see that in what we talk about today. Last week in lesson two, we learned that the kingdom is worth surrendering all that I have in order to gain. We learned that the kingdom requires repentance and belief in the good news for entry. And we learned that the kingdom requires willing and diligent hearts, AKA good soil that make the kingdom a priority. With that in mind, let's go ahead and open with prayer this morning. Father, God, this group of ladies together with me come to you this morning and ask you to allow your Holy Spirit to be our teacher today. We affirm that part of what your kingdom is, is us surrendering all that we have, putting entire belief, our complete weight, turning and believing what you say about the kingdom and becoming members of the kingdom. We also recognize that we want our hearts to be good soil. We want to be attentive, willing listeners who will understand the words that you are teaching to us and will put them to use in such a way that we become healthy plants that bear fruit and evidence that we really are members of your kingdom. We ask you to do that for us today. As we open your word, as we talk about the things that we learn about your kingdom, that you would sow those seeds deep into our hearts. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. What I want to do today, uh, Lori has already told you that, is we're going to look at what some of our normal expectations of earthly kingdoms are. And then we're going to talk about how very different the kingdom is that Jesus talked about. So, if we weren't necessarily on video and we had a little bit of time here, I'd kind of brainstorm these with you. Like, what, what are some of the expectations of normal earthly kingdoms that we have? So thank you for being patient with me as I go through these. But hopefully, you'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. If there's one that's missing, would you please see me after the session so that I can work it in? Because I, I do want to make sure that this had a feeling that we were doing this together. At least one of those first expectations of a kingdom is that there's some kind of a ruler. There's a king. I mean, it's not unusual that the word king is part of the word kingdom. Or a queen. Or an emperor. Or a president. Or a prime minister. Or some kind of ruler or sovereign is another word we use for that. Does that make sense? Would be your expectation of a kingdom. Somebody's in charge. We're going to review this list now, and we're going to review it at the very end again. Another expectation is, you know, so you got a king and you got a kingdom, but it's not really a kingdom if there aren't people in it. So sometimes people in earthly kingdoms are called subjects or citizens. And then one of the third characteristics is there's a territory. There's some boundaries. Um, this land belongs to that kingdom. I want to thank uh, one of the teachers in my class who said these are the three primary characters in my Sunday class, uh, who we're also studying the kingdom in my Sunday class. I got two great teachers that are teaching there. Uh, but says these are the three primary characteristics. But let's talk about that territory boundary thing. When you get a globe of the world and you look at it, what do you see? Country boundaries. Isn't that what kind of defines the globe for you? Those are all kingdoms, right? Because they all are defined as territories that are ruled by some governmental entity that has the characteristics of a kingdom. So we're just for, we're going to call them all little kingdoms. Um, their territories and boundaries. Any kingdom has those. Some other characteristics. Uh, there are armies or some kind of a military force 
that defends current territory, keeps the boundary secure, and sometimes expands to more regions. And there are generally some taxes, or there are resources that are gathered by the ruler in order to fund the operations of the kingdom. Am I giving some of the ones that you would expect of a normal earthly kingdom? OK. There are laws and rules that are intended to keep order and provide security. In other words, within that kingdom, there are plots of land that people own, and there's some kind of a law that says you can't take the other guy's property. Provide some security and protection. Some other characteristics of normal earthly kingdoms. There are generally classes of people. In other words, there's the sovereign, and then generally right below is some kind of aristocracy or some sometimes considered royalty, but some high level. There's privileged, elite, whatever you want to call them. There's mid-level rulers. There's usually some hierarchy of rulership. And then there's some kind of working class, the ones who kind of do the work that gets done. But there's different levels of people, usually within a kingdom. And then a kingdom is often preceded by a forceful or violent overthrow of another kingdom. Think about your Old Testament stories. What was the experience of the children of Israel leaving the kingdom of Egypt, going to the promised land, and eventually setting up the Saul, Saul's kingdom, and then the Davidic kingdom, and then all the kingdoms that came afterwards? And what was one of the characteristics that you saw there? <sighs> Lots of war, lots of battles, protecting, expanding, defending, right? And then think about the history that you've learned in school. Can't you trace a lot of the history you've learned to the rise and fall of various earthly kingdoms? Are there any governmental entities on earth? that wouldn't qualify as a normal earthly kingdom, at least have most of those characteristics. We experience them today. We might talk about that a little bit later, but just think about that. We experience them today. We live in the kingdom of Arizona, which is in the United States of America, right? And sometimes if you think about even smaller things, Grace Community Church, the civic group that you belong to, your neighborhood association. Do you not see some of those characteristics at play? If you think about the smallest, most isolated tribal group in some jungle, in some isolated area of the world, there's usually a chief. There's usually some territory which within, uh, within which they roam, hunt, farm, against which they defend outsiders coming in. OK, I want to talk today about some scripture that tell us that it's a little bit different. So now, fortunately for us, in this, in this next little bit, we're going to look at some scripture where Jesus talks directly about the kingdom, not a comparison story that we kind of have to figure out what he means, but he says some very specific words. You recall the last couple of weeks I pointed out to you that John Gospel John's gospel uses the kingdom the fewest number of times in only two settings. And the one setting we've talked about now in John 3, this is where Jesus said, in order to enter the kingdom, you must be born again. You must be born of water and of the spirit. And we talked about that one in detail last week. Today, we're going to go to John 18, which is the other occurrence in the gospel of John where Jesus talks about the kingdom. And I want to build a little bit of context. If you can turn to John 18, go ahead and do that. You'll notice that at the beginning of that scripture, there's some things going on. Uh, right before, uh, oh, so beginning at the, at the very first part of John 18, we find that um, Jesus is arrested and taken to the home of the high priest. 
Now, keep in mind, these high priests are rulers. Rulers in what kingdom? Well, in the Jewish religious kingdom. That's why Jesus is taken to them, because he's trampled a little bit on some of their kingdom stuff. But they have a specific purpose in mind. Um, they want him dead. And within their kingdom, which they're allowed to rule within a larger kingdom, um, they're not able to execute that kind of a sentence on somebody. So they take him to Pilate, because they want Pilate to give him a death sentence. Who's Pilate? Well, Pilate is a regional governor within a very large earthly kingdom, the Roman Empire. He's one of those ruler, mid-level ruler guys. He's way down the food chain. But he's within that kingdom. So they take him to him, and he originally tries to pass him back to them and kind of go, this is not a, this is not a Roman kingdom issue. This is a Jewish kingdom issue. But they won't have it because they know what their end is. So they kind of explain to Pilate what their purpose is. And so then Pilate goes, oh, OK. So Pilate brings Jesus in to question him. So that's the context. And I think it's an important context to realize that part of this is a conflict of kingdoms here that's going on. And so let's go ahead and read in John 18, beginning with verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, because this is this back and forth between, are you going to take him? Am I going to take him? Are you going to take him? No, I'm taking him. Okay. And called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, that was an interesting question. First question that John records that Pilate asks of Jesus. Why do you think Pilate asks this question? Well, at least for me, Maybe the Jews told him that he's a threat to his kingdom. That's why he needs to pay attention to this guy, because he's setting himself up to be a king. So, um, so Pilate asks this question. Well, it's interesting, because if you look in verse 34 and 35, Jesus wonders the same thing. And he, asks, he goes back to Pilate. After he asks the question, are you the king of the Jews? Um, Jesus says back to Pilate, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? So Jesus confronts Pilate about his very question. I think what Jesus is partly trying to do is, are you serious about the answer to this question? Or are you just doing what the people who delivered me are telling you to do? And he kind of goes, I, you know, I kind of see this as, I don't really care. This is a Jewish issue. They brought you to me. So what have you done? So he broadens the question, not just what, you know, are you the king of the Jews, asking him that question, but broadens the question. So what have you done that's got them so excited about you? And now Jesus decides to answer his original question. Goes back. Look at verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Wow. This is three of the five occurrences in John, and they're all in one verse. And it's got some rather possessive language with it, doesn't it? As a matter of, king, of, of, of noticing, I mean, you can't not notice that he says, my kingdom, three times. I think he's trying to communicate to Pilate a message there. And we don't want to miss it. Whose kingdom is it? My kingdom. Who's the my? The person speaking. Who's the person speaking? Jesus. Whose kingdom does this belong to? Jesus. In front of Pilate, he's claiming ownership of the kingdom. Let's talk about that just a little bit more about what he says to Pilate about all that. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. And then at the end, he says, it's not from the world. Notice how that language should have quelled some of Pilate's disturbance about, is this guy a political threat to my kingdom? 
but it really didn't. Let's find another way that he quells it. When Jesus talks about my kingdom not being of this world, what does that mean to you or from the world? Well, he gives us an answer to that in the middle sentence. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that you, I might not be delivered over to the Jews. So what's one of the characteristics of earthly kingdoms we see Jesus talking about right there? No army, no military force. That should have caught Pilate's attention because if he has a kingdom, he's got no military force. So, Pilate, remember his question was, are you king of the Jews? And instead of answering that, Jesus did what? He talked about his kingdom. Well, he answered the question, but Pilate decides to probe just a little bit deeper. Oh, we kind of did that. What would a kingdom not of this world or from this world mean to you? You might want to consider that. So we know at least one of the characteristics of worldly kingdoms, some kind of military force isn't there. Does a kingdom of this world or from this world? To me, kind of of this world means it looks like all the other kingdoms. From this world means it somehow derives its power from the world. It's from the world. What creates power for kingdoms on earth? Generally, people's willingness to subscribe to them. Jesus is saying the authority for this kingdom comes from a whole, its origin comes from a whole different place. But, and what might you expect of such a kingdom? I'm going to challenge you throughout today and even up until the very end to consider what you're expecting of the kingdom of God and how it might not be what Jesus said that it was. Okay, so we still got this story going on between Pilate and Jesus. And so Pilate goes, I ask you, are you king of the Jews? You talked about your kingdom, so just checking. So you are a king, right? I mean, that's what you're saying. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. Now, that seems to be like he's putting it back on him, but in some ways that can be interpreted as, so you say, This is important. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, dash, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Now, there are many interpretations of this. Oftentimes, this sentence is just lifted completely out of this story. And we think that what the purpose Jesus is talking about is to tell the truth. But in the whole context, What's the truth Jesus is talking about? His kingdom. He's describing his kingdom. And so I interpret this to be, for this purpose, I was born and I come into the world to bear witness to the truth of my kingdom. And those who hear my voice understand and listen to those truth words I'm speaking about the kingdom. This has great similarity to the parable of the sower and the seed and the soil last week when we talk about what kind of soil do you know what I think Jesus is doing here? He's testing to see whether Pilate's got any rich soil he can sow a seed in. I'm telling you the truth, guy. Are you ready to hear it? Now, if you look at the very next verse, Pilate says, what is truth? But then he doesn't pursue that. You almost get the sense that Pilate goes, no, nah, you know, what is truth? Moving on. But this is a challenge. I believe that one of the purposes, Jesus, again, is saying, remember early we read that in the beginning of his ministry, one of the accounts was that Jesus said, I have to go on to the other villages and proclaim the kingdom because for this purpose I was born. So what's Jesus really saying to Pilate? I have a kingdom, but it's not your normal kingdom, Pilate. Are you ready to hear the words of the truth about my real kingdom? Let's think for a moment and go back to the beginning of Jesus' life because as we know, this story is told near the end of his life. Remember at the beginning when he's tempted by Satan and Satan again offers him all the earthly kingdoms? 
The fact that right near the end of his life, he's saying, my kingdom is not of this world or from this world, explains one of the reasons Jesus rejected those. Because both Satan and Jesus knew he was here to get a kingdom, and it wasn't going to be an earthly, normal kingdom. Those were the wrong kingdoms. And at the end, he proclaims that before a ruler in another kingdom. I think point one is the kingdom is not of or from this world. And Jesus says it loudly and clearly. Let's move on to point two. I got I to gotta go. I got a lot of stuff today. Okay. All right. Let's look at Luke 17, 20 and 21. If you'll turn to those scriptures with me. This is another one of the times when Jesus talks fairly directly about the kingdom, not in any comparison story. It's interesting because he's talking to another group. He's being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Now, who are the Pharisees again? Mm, they're kind of mid-level rulers within the Jewish kingdom in Jerusalem at the time. High priest that we read about in the previous passage is kind of the supreme ruler in that one. And these Pharisees and rulers and scribes and the council are part of these aristocratic rulers, mid-level rulers. And they ask when the kingdom of God would come. Now, what are they thinking? They're thinking Old Testament. They're thinking Davidic kingdom. They're thinking prophets. They're thinking a new David coming and establishing an earthly kingdom. And they want to know because one of the fervent prayers of the Jewish people at the time was that God's kingdom would come. So they care about it. So they ask this upstart rabbi, when's it coming? He answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is. Or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. That's a bit of an enigmatic answer. Again, what would be the normal ways that the Pharisees are asking for the kingdom to come? They're looking for a bloody battle that determines some winners and losers. And who's the loser? Well, who's the first loser they're looking to be? The Roman Empire. The oppressive rulers that are over them right then. Their hope for the kingdom of God is for freedom from a ruling empire. And they're expecting a king coming in on a horse with an army and just taking care of stuff. They're looking for an old king to be overthrown. They're looking for a new king to take up residence in some castle somewhere. It's not really a castle. They're looking for somebody for God to reside again in the temple, for the king, the rightful owner of the Jewish kingdom to come in and take residence among them. They're looking for new laws and rules to be established, not these ones that the Romans have imposed upon them, but new godly rules and, and uh, laws. They're looking for the former elite to be banished. Now, who are they thinking of as the elite at this moment? The Romans. But they are looking for a new elite to be elevated and rewarded. And who would they expect that to be? Themselves. They're looking for some kingdom assets to be reshuffled. For the haves to become have-nots and the have-nots to become haves. They're looking for some plans for some expansion laid out. I mean, this kingdom is such a good thing. Let's go ahead and expand this thing. Let's bring more people into this kingdom. They're expecting maybe some new taxes to be levied because, you know, it takes resources to run a kingdom. But I think this is one of the most important characteristics of our normal earthly expectations of kingdoms. We hope for better. Everybody who's looking for a new kingdom hopes it will be better. Or if they were part of the elite in the previous kingdom, what do they do? They're afraid. They're fearful. They're fearful of losing what they've got. They're fearful of losing their power. They're fearful of losing their standing, their property, whatever that might be. 
But for these Pharisees, when they hope for a kingdom, what is it that they are most hoping for? We've talked a little bit about that. I'm going to ask you kind of a self-searching question here today. When you hope for a kingdom change, what is it you're most hoping for? Now, I'm going to put something out there that I'm not going to talk anymore about. But you know what? In a few weeks, America could be going through a kingdom change. What earthly expectations do you have of what might happen in that kingdom change? Or not change, whatever the case may be. Moving on. All right. Um, Jesus answers them saying, it's not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. Um, we sometimes, I'm going to go back, we sometimes hear this preached on as the kingdom of God, uh, oh, the, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. What does that mean? We hear this preached on as... Um, that God's kingdom comes into the heart of man. And when the midst of you is talking about man's heart. And I think that's an okay interpretation. I think that's certainly true. I don't think that's what this is saying because who's his audience? Pharisees, who we know pretty much have closed hearts. And he's saying, he's using a present tense, is. So he's saying to people he knows don't really want to know the truth. And he's saying the kingdom is in your midst right now. What's he saying? Well, I think this is one of the valid interpretations of this scripture. Jesus is kind of going, here. It's right here. He's saying, you are asking what you think is a normal man, certainly an interesting rabbi, and you're asking, that's how you're looking at him, and you're asking him to tell you when the kingdom of God is coming, and he's saying to you, where is the kingdom? Right here. And you know why the kingdom is right here? Because the kingdom is in the world. At this point, Jesus is going, me, me. Who is Jesus? The king. How is the kingdom in the midst of them? The king's right there in their very presence. And they're looking right past him and not even seeing the king walking among them. Notice the importance of this. Jesus is saying, while my kingdom earlier or later when he says to Pilate, it's not of this world, it's not from this world, but it certainly is in the world. We got a lot more to cover. Okay, here we go. All right. Now we're going to go back to the parables in Matthew 13. And we're going to cover those other four. We're going to do one of them long and three of them really short. Let's go back to Matthew 13 verses 24 to 30, where we read that. He put another parable for them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good feed in his field, but while, seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. But let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, go gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather my wheat into my barn. So this is another one of those comparison stories. Notice in this one, it's about the seed, not the soil. The first one we looked at, it was about the soil. This is about seed, because there's two kinds of seed that both produce plants. The good seed becomes wheat, and the bad seed becomes weeds. Now, weeds doesn't quite catch it here, and I don't have a long time to talk about this, but King James is tares, and I think there's a couple of other, but mostly, most of the translations say weeds. Uh, it's really darnel, is the name of it. It's a type of ryegrass. It's called false wheat, and it's called poisonous ryegrass because it often has a fungus that can cause one to get dizzy or intoxicated or die. That's why they never harvested it. 
Its seeds are actually kind of a purple to black color, but it's a rye. Notice that in this particular story, plants grew from both seeds. The field workers noticed and asked about a fix for the problem, and the master gave them instructions about what they were supposed to do. So let's look at that in more detail. Fortunately, this is the second of the parables in Matthew 15 that Jesus actually tells an explanation for. Interesting, the first one he just explains to them. In this particular one, he waits for them to ask, but they do ask, and he does explain it. Whew. All right, jump down to Matthew 13, 36, and you find his explanation there. And he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Don't you like a straight translation where this is that, and that's that, and that's that, and that's that. Okay. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear. There's a lot of difficult stuff in this one, and we're not going to go there. I want to stay a little bit more at a helicopter view, but who's the sower of the good seed? What does it say? Who sowed the seed? The Son of Man. Now, it's important to know that the Son of Man was Jesus' most favorite label for himself. When he would be talking, he would often say, the Son of Man, and he'd be saying, me. Okay? And that's how his disciples would have understood this. The field. What's the field? The world. The whole world. That globe that we look at that has all those boundaries and drawn all over it, you know, all the little country boundaries and stuff? Jesus is going, eh, my kingdom's in the world, that whole world. What's the good seed? Sons of the kingdom. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. The rest of our translation chart. Who's the planter of the bad seed? The devil. And what is the bad seed or the darnel or the weeds? They're called sons of the evil one. And who are the reapers? We got a lot of people and things in this story. Angels. They're sent by the Son of Man. That's significant. Who do the angels answer to? Jesus. Are we close to being caught up there? Okay. What's the harvest? When? What, what do we hear and know about the harvest? It happens at the end of the age. There's that not yet thing. So there's some aspect of the kingdom that's now and some aspect that's coming some other time. At the end of the age, what's going to happen? The sons of the evil one, the causes of sin and lawbreakers, are gathered out of the kingdom and thrown into a fiery furnace. That's what the scripture says. I'm not going to go into more detail about But there's, there's a consequence for the sons of the evil one, the bad seed. Because what I really want to concentrate on here is that Jesus is telling us that the kingdom is in the world. And how do we identify where the kingdom is? It's where the people are. It's where the people of the kingdom are. It's where those wheat stalks are planted. Kingdom people are among non-kingdom people. The wheat and the darnel are all mixed up. Does that kind of look like what our world likes to, looks like today? Yeah. And the current territory of the kingdom, it's the world. It's the whole thing. It's the whole globe. There are no earthly boundaries to exclude it, fence it in, or on which it cannot cross. I'm going to concentrate on the word sons for just a couple minutes. A few, because it's important. You notice in 
37, 38, 41, the word son occurs four times. Twice, it talks about the son of man. Once, it talks about the sons of the kingdom. And once, it talks about the sons of the evil one. The Greek word there, or the son of man calls it, well, first of all, let's do an ownership thing. The son of man calls it his kingdom. We know that later to Pilate, he calls it my kingdom three times. So point number three, the kingdom belongs to Jesus. He owns it. Could have done it back in Luke, but wanted to wait here till we hear the son of man. It's, it's my kingdom. My angels are going to go do the reaping for me. I'm the one who planted the sons in the first place. The, the wheat seed, I planted it. All right, now let's look at that word sons. The Greek word is huios. Huios comes in both a singular and a plural form. It's important to note that the son of man is the word huios capitalized. And so when Jesus says the son, the means distinctive, singular, unique, the, the one. And it's capitalized in the Greek, actually in the Greek text itself with a capital H, and Jesus refers to himself as the Son. On the other hand, singer, singular noun capitalized. The other two occurrences of Son here are a plural form of the word huioi. That difference is just singular, capital, uh, plural. And it's small case, so it's a category of people. It's sons. Plural noun. So technically, the translations that you have that say that the son of man plants sons of the kingdom is correct because it's the same Greek word. But it's important to note that in general application of that word, huioi, it means children or offspring. That's what it really means. And so as many translations will call this that the son of man plants children of the kingdom, which is an accurate translation. Also, it's just that the son's son's matches shows you that the Greek words are the same. In fact, the original King James Version, the old one, called them children of the kingdom, did that translation. There are a few translations on, I don't know, you may be looking at one, that say people of the kingdom. I think that's probably the least accurate of the translations because it doesn't have that children, offspring, son connotation to it, just saying the people of the kingdom. So what do we know when the son of man plants children of the kingdom? I'm going to use that for right now. That they have the nature of their parents, their children. That they have a relationship with their parents. Children of the kingdom is a mind blower because it tells us that we aren't just subjects in the kingdom. We aren't just war spoils. We aren't just victims of some kingdom takeover. We're not vassal servants within the kingdom in order to provide taxes and resources for the kingdom to run. We're born into the kingdom as sons and daughters. Now that goes perfectly well with what we learned last week. How do we enter the kingdom? We are born again by the water and by spirit. So what Jesus is reiterating through this story is what he's going to say over and over again. The people who are in Jesus' kingdom, they're not these. They're sons and daughters. That's a different kind of kingdom. How many kingdoms do you know that are made up of children of the king? And that's all there is. Every one of them is a child of the king. The kingdom is made up of sons and daughters. Point number four. Now, Jesus tells one more parable that I want to just touch on lightly. Oh, I'm sorry. This is kind of my summary of that. For the kingdom that is on earth now, populated with sons and daughters of the kingdom, growing alongside sons of the evil one, a time is coming when the kingdom's, king's going to separate his kingdom out, separate the other kingdom out and his kingdom and keep it for himself. All right. The kingdom will be sorted out in the future. 
That's another thing we learn from this parable. There's going to be a sorting come. And so there's another parable that follows this one that just reiterates that. So I just want to make sure that we don't miss it. In Matthew 13, 47 and 48, we read, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted out the good into containers but threw away the bad. And as we go ahead and continue reading in that, it says, So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice some of the same language for the end of those who aren't considered to be in the kingdom of God to the previous one about the wheat and the weeds. So there's going to be a sorting at the end of the age, just like with the wheat and the, and the darnel, where the sep there will be a separation of the evil from the righteous. before we get to this one. So this one tells us a similar story to the one about the wheat and the darnel in that the kingdom is in the world. So this is about fish, fish in the sea. We're all swimming in the same sea. That's a similar metaphor to the world, right? The plant, the, the kingdom being the field. Um, and the end is going to be similar. All right, so I, that, would, that one is just kind of like, and in case you didn't get it the first time, let me tell it to you another way, as fish in the sea. All right, let's look at the last two parables. The parable of the mustard seed reads like this. He put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And then he tells another one right on the heels of it. And he told them another parable. He got into parable telling. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is like heaven, leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now, what are the characteristics he's pointing out here? First of all, don't you love it? Three of the seven parables in chapter 13 are about seed. One is about seed that is the words of the kingdom coming to land in soil. The second one is about wheat seed that is completely different and represents a son of daughter of the kingdom. And then this seed is the kingdom itself. Jesus is saying the kingdom is like a little, little tiny seed that becomes something much more than you would ever imagine from it. And he's talking about a growth principle here. What is the growth principle of how seeds grow? I don't know. And I don't think that science has sufficiently explained it with all of its cell splitting and reproduction and genes and DNA and things happen and all of a sudden this becomes that. As a matter of fact, I tried to come up with a word and I'm going to ask you to think about it and maybe put your own down. But that's the same thing with, I'm sorry, with leaven. So how is it that that little tiny spore of yeast that you spoon out of the jar, you know, and you try to keep them from bouncing around and going places you don't want them to go while you just try to get them into the bowl? How does that take a little tiny bunch of dough and make it this, if you just leave it long enough? How is it that Jesus' kingdom grows? Not by army conquest, not by political takeover. And this is where I ran into trouble. The kingdom ha grows in unexplainable, miraculous, organic ways. Right. It's got that life element in it that comes from the Father. And it grows according to a life principle of how life actually exists. So you pick a word to fill in that blank. I've given you a few to consider. I had unexplainable in there, but you know, it is explainable because it's God, but it's certainly not very humanly explainable. So we've learned a lot about the kingdom today, and I've kind of been all over the map, so I sort of want to pull it together for us right here at the end. We're going to go back to that beginning list that we had of what normal earthly kingdoms look like 
and kind of see what is it that we learn from Jesus in the scriptures that we've looked at today. Earthly kingdoms, remember they have rulers, kings, queens, emperors, presidents, prime ministers. What did we learn about today? There's a king. His name is Jesus. Calls himself the son of man. And he makes it really clear it's his kingdom. It's his kingdom. Now, I don't want to pass up the fact that in the one parable, particularly in the wheat and the weeds, Jesus says, and the sons of the kingdom will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. What? So whose kingdom is it? Is it the Father's kingdom? Is it God's kingdom? Is it Jesus' kingdom? And again, my favorite answer is yes. Yes. Jesus uses those words. I mean, in this parable right here where he calls himself the Son of Man and I'm directing the angels and I'm doing stuff, he calls it the kingdom of the Father. I don't think Jesus is confused. Earthly kingdoms have subjects, conquered ones, citizens. That's how kingdoms work. Our own earthly expectations is that when a new king comes to power, they straighten out those other people. You know what Jesus says? You're all my sons and daughters. The common characteristic you have is that you were all born into this kingdom the same way. Earthly kingdoms have territories and boundaries to be protected and expanded. Well, we'll say just a little bit more about that in a minute, but to be protected. What does Jesus say? Eh, I got one of those. <laughs> What's his kingdom right now? Where is his kingdom? In the whole world. In the world. Jesus doesn't look at any part of this globe and go, oh, my kingdom. Now, we know, according to the Great Commission, we're working to bring word of that kingdom into places where it hasn't yet been heard. But can Jesus go into those places and plant sons of his kingdom? Yeah, he can. There is no boundary that keeps Jesus' kingdom out. Taxes to fund operations. Now, we aren't going to talk a lot about this because, frankly, Jesus didn't talk about it. But what do you suppose the answer to this is? Not needed, because you know what? The king owns it all anyway. We are going to talk next week about what the king does expect of us, and it isn't taxes. There's an armed military to defend normal kingdoms, right? What did Jesus tell us about that? I ain't got one. There's a military to make conquests, to enlarge the kingdom, to expand it. What did Jesus tell us about the growth of his kingdom? It's this unexplainable, organic, life principle growth. The two we haven't talked about, rules and laws and classes of people we're going to talk about next week. So we haven't gotten there yet. But I hope that you've begun to see that sometimes when we hear the word kingdom, we think that. And Jesus was pretty clear. It ain't that. It's something different. And I think that when we start to look at the kingdom of God as worldwide, defined by the sons and daughters who live in it, and how they act and behave and what they say and do that identifies them as fruit and evidence that they are sons and daughters of the kingdom, we begin to see the kingdom in a little different light than through our normal earthly expectations. So let's pray. King Jesus, we come to you recognizing that so much of what you taught about your kingdom, both through the parables as well as direct language that you used with us, told us that our expectations about a kingdom that would show up, that we could point to, that would look like what the Pharisees were looking for, that would look like what Pilate was looking for when he said, are you king of the Jews? You were very clear to teach us, it's not that. That your kingdom expands through this whole world. And so we praise you and thank you that there isn't a place we can go that we aren't in the kingdom because your kingdom isn't defined by a boundary. It's defined by us daughters and sons of the kingdom and where we are planted and where we are becoming wheat. 
We thank you that your kingdom grows in ways that we can't explain, that ways that only you can guide and lead, in ways that are like little tiny seeds and spores of yeast becoming something much bigger than they ever were when they were beginning. So we ask for your kingdom to come. We ask for there to be more sons and daughters of your kingdom that are planted throughout this world. We ask that they would become more evident and distinguishable from the tares and the darnel and the wheat that are all around us. And that you would encourage our hearts that you are the king, that we are your daughters and your sons, and that you would lead us in a way that experiences that kingdom living this week, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I do have a couple of discussion questions. So for those of you who are watching on the video today, I'm going to put these up on the screen, and then I'm going to encourage you to take a little bit of time to just ponder those yourself. But we're going to discuss those here among ourselves. So our two discussion questions today are, what surprises you most about what Jesus said about the kingdom today? And what impresses you most is something, I want to remember that. I want to sink that into the soil a little bit. So... With that, we say goodbye to our video audience, if we haven't already, and, um, and we'll go ahead with our discussion here.